Hi, this is Eric. Today we're going to look at the game Tapalov Mamad Yarov from Game 6 of the Gashimov Memorial, which was played yesterday. So, this opening line played by Tapalov, it started off just at kind of as a normal Rai Lopez, and they actually followed known games until move 18 when Tapalov tried a new move. And it turns out that it actually wasn't really particularly dangerous, but it served its purpose during the game. So this will be pr a pretty quick game because all of the explosions occurred in the middle of the game. And um, the game didn't last much longer. He played a new idea basically around move 18. And it took play into a new type of position around move 25. And then after just a few moves, the position kind of completely fell apart for black. So let's take a look at what happened here. D6, C3. So just to say one thing really, really quickly, one of the core ideas for white in the Rai Lopez is to try to establish an ideal pawn center with pawns on D4 and E4. But usually they will play H3 first to avoid any problems with bishop G4. So after castling, white's main move is to play H3. Although, of course, many players do play d4, but this is the overwhelming main line. Bishop to b7, d4, rook e8. So this basically, will, with bishop b7 and rook e8, that signals the start of the Zaitsev variation. And Topolov, in this particular position, decided to repeat moves to gain time. And the reason why they do this is because they gain extra time at move 40. So with a 30-second increment, he decides, well... I may as well gain a minute on the clock, and later on, I'll be closer to the time control. So it's usually a, a risk-free and purposeful venture. So rook e8 was played, and now white has a question of how to develop the pieces. He decided to go for knight bd2, and then just to play a3 and bishop a2. That's a very sensible setup, because, because basically what he's doing here is he's playing a3, he's planning to move the bishop back, either to c2 or a2, and in many cases to play b4 to try to clamp down on the queen side a bit. So black played g6, so he's trying to put the bishop on g7, probably the best place for that bishop to be. Bishop to a2, bishop to g7, and here Topolov played b4. And so essentially now black has a big decision to make. Does he play e takes d4 and d5? Should he play try to prepare a5? Should he play d5? So essentially things are going to explode very quickly here and black needs to make a decision. He decided to trade away his, his e5 stronghold for the c3 pawn, but the idea was to strike at the b4 pawn immediately after that, after undermining it a little bit. So he played e takes d4, c takes d4, a5. And of course, the reason why I'm not criticizing any of these moves at all is because this is all mainline theory, and this is considered to be a variation that's objectively sound for black. So in this position, white's tried a couple of different moves. Knight g5 has been played in multiple games. Queen b3 has been played. And in this game, Topolov played the novelty rook to b1. I thought this was a really interesting move. And initially, I was thinking, oh, okay, so a takes b4 d5 and his goal is to take back on b4 with the rook so this is quite an interesting plan a takes b4 d5 so he advances his ideal pawn center and essentially what black has to do is put the knight in the center otherwise he's just going to have a bad knight so he plays knight to e5 and this is a, a quite reasonable trait knight takes e5 d takes e5 so in a sense black actually does improve his pawn structure slightly and after rook takes b4. So now black basically has the question of, well, how do I obtain counterplay? And the d5 pawn is, is a pretty good pawn there, just kind of creating a little bit of an annoying wedge in black's position. So black plays c6 to undermine it. c6, d takes c6, bishop takes c6, and white played queen f3. And the thing I really like about this game, and the thing I really like about Topolov's play here is that he didn't really do anything that amazing. He didn't, he didn't, for example, carry out any really, really complicated idea or combination. But basically what he did is he provoked black to put his pieces on awkward squares and created a whole bunch of different pins. And so in this position, what we have here is we have this pin 
and we have the queen pinning the f6 knight to f7. So later we're going to see a couple more pins. So bishop to f8 was played, attacking the rook on b4. White could have played rook to b3, but he played rook b1. I think that looks quite good. Rook b1, rook a4. So essentially, black's putting a bunch of pressure on the e4 pawn, and white needs to decide what to do about it. So I really like what Topolov did right now. He opted for knight to f1. And when I first saw that move, I thought, wow, that's a really in-your-face type of move. And it's especially surprising because the bishop is able to take the e4 pawn, hitting the queen and also the rook on b1. And in this position, it actually would have made a lot of sense to take on e4, to play bishop takes e4, rook takes e4, rook takes e4. But the tactical point was to play bishop g5, pinning the f6 knight to the queen and preparing to just go bishop takes f6 and then try to take the rook on e4. But the, import, the most important point here is that black is actually able to just give the material back, which is an important tool when defending and you have, let's say, an extra exchange, like in this case. So he could have actually just played rook to f4. And then after bishop takes f4, e takes f4, he kind of makes his way out of the mud. So. That would have been a good way to try to simplify the position and effectively equalize. But essentially he played another move, which was also perfectly fine. He played rook takes e4. And now Topolov played rook to d1. And so notice that now there's an extra pin here, by the way. So we have the pin aimed against f7 and g8. We also have the pin here. And we also have the pin here on, against the undefended c6 bishop. So we have three pins. And if you think about it, well, there's going to be a new pin starting up in a second. Queen e7 was played, and then bishop g5. So here we have our fourth pin. One, two, <laughs> three, four. So essentially, you usually can't get many more pins than this with a queen pinning diagonally and, and uh, vertically, and, and the bishops, both of the bishops with separate pins. So black played bishop to g7. And the next move was also pretty surprising. Of course, it was natural because white's improving his worst place piece, but he plays knight to e3, bringing the knight in. And now it gets especially tricky because what was so difficult about this whole sequence is white is still down a pawn, and he just he did not play for anything immediate, but he improved all of his pieces. He created a bunch of pins. He created disharmony in black's position, and then he simply improved his knight, and now it's getting very tricky deciding how black should defend this. So what he could do is he could play rook c4, attacking the queen on f3. If white plays knight to d5, bishop takes d5, rook takes d5. So in this position, what black could do, similar to what we were looking at before, is black can actually give back the material, just like he did in the, in the previous variation with rook f4. And this breaks the pin on the g5 to e7 diagonal, basically breaking the pin on the queen. So after bishop takes f4, he could play knight takes d5. So this would have been a perfectly acceptable way for black to play. Of course, it requires pretty good board vision in terms of seeing moves taking place on both sides of the board, but this would have been a good way to play it. So essentially, he played queen takes a3, which was also perfectly fine, by the way. And so after queen takes a3, now we're in a position where black is up two pawns. White plays rook to a1, and notice that with the queen here on a3, white is threatening bishop takes f7 check. So the queen has to move away, and the queen is in a very tricky position because it's not exactly clear where it should go. So queen c5 was effectively the losing move, so the game was lost on this move. If queen e7, a natural move is bishop to d5 trying to kind of intercept the connection and, uh, in, well, interfere with the connection between the c6 bishop and the e4 rook. And now, after something like bishop takes d5, knight takes d5, black completely loses. But he can play rook takes e3 and then play bishop takes d5 afterwards. Queen takes e3, bishop takes d5. And if bishop takes f6, for example, queen to e6, take, take. And here, black's in a position with two pawns for the exchange. Can put the bishop on c4, this position should be objectively drawn. So he would have been able to have two pawns for the exchange and defend the position, but here, 
After queen c5, now there was just rook dc1. So notice the incredible disharmony between black's pieces. His piece coordination is very, very bad here. And notice one very nice tactical point. So if queen to d6, for instance, we can play take, 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 and knight to g4. And here we have all of our pins in, in full motion. So we have this pin right here, this pin right here, and we have the other pin right here. The pin against the undefended c6 queen. It's important to note that just because a queen is in the middle of the board doesn't mean it can't be undefended. A lot of people forget that the queen can be undefended just like anything else. So we have three separate pins and white wins. So for instance, if king g7, we just play knight takes f6, queen takes f6, and the rook on e4 is no longer defended by the queen, so we simply pick off the rook. So after rook dc1, black played rook c4, and white just played another quiet move, another simple quiet move, queen to d1. And there was effectively no defense here. This is very nice. And notice that, notice that if he plays, for instance, rook takes c1, rook takes c1, queen to b6, just trying to move the queen out of the way to defend this. Bishop takes, bishop takes, and queen to d6 with the double attack against the, queen, against the um, bishop on c6, pinned to the queen, and the bishop on f6. So that double attack does the trick. White wins a piece, and white wins the game. So very nice tactics. There was, this was completely caused by Black's bad piece coordination, and White did an amazing job of setting this all up. So the skill in White's play was playing a very interesting pawn sacrifice that caused Black to really scramble up all of his pieces and put them on very bad squares. So now knight to e4 was played, and White just played bishop takes, pawn takes, Rook takes c4, and black decided to not even play this out. And one of the points is, let's say, if, uh, let's say if queen to b5, we can just play queen c2 here, hitting the bishop on c6, also, also hitting the, the knight on e4. And so if knight takes g5, we can just play rook takes c6, and uh, white has a decisive advantage. So this was a great game by Topalov. The, as I said, one of the great skills here is outplaying somebody in an equal position. And so he played a line, which is objectively sound. Seems like he surprised his opponent. And he just took his opponent into a position that was very difficult to play for black. And a lot of the time over the board, what wins games is just making your opponent have to solve difficult problems and make difficult decisions. So Topalov did a great job of that. And we're going to see how the rest of the tournament goes.